list on the market as we move forward into 2023. So uh, I'm sure you all will, will have lots of questions for him, and, and we welcome him and, and thank him for coming up from Arkansas. Well, I, I uh, appreciate the kind introduction. Um, so yeah, we, we both started 2020. Uh, what a time to be alive as a livestock economist. Um, the, the talk I'll give today, I think, is probably a lot more optimistic than the talks that we've been giving the past couple of years with regards to uh, market outlook. I'm sure there's probably a few more smiling faces in the room today than, than probably even just a year ago. So um, a lot more optimism with regards to markets relative to two years ago when I first started with the university where it seemed from week to week we didn't know whether the world was going to end or not. Um, so again, the, the theme for today will certainly be, be optimism. Um, so I am the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I will try to be on time. If there's something that I don't cover that you'd like to visit about, we can certainly have that discussion um, as a group during questions or privately as well. I'll stick around for lunch. So um, hopefully I cover everything that you're hoping to hear. If I don't, uh, just please ask. So I think the, the easiest way to, to just start this talk off, with, talk off with is just to start looking at markets. Um, so this graph shows uh, monthly average Kentucky prices for five and six weight steers. Um, it, it's fun to, to talk about uh, Kentucky cattle markets when we've got Dr. Burdine, the guy that probably knows more about uh, Kentucky cattle markets than just about anybody. But um, uh-oh, there we go. But um, we can kind of see the trajectory that we've started off this year. So I've got a couple numbers here, $193 a hundredweight. That was the, as of today, February average price for five and six weight steers up $13 a hundredweight compared to, to January of this year. Over $20 a hundredweight compared to just a year ago. So again, there's a lot of, a lot of optimism in this market really starting to, to um, show the tight supply situation that we're in as an industry. Um, and the expectation that we'll share at the end is that we're gonna continue to see these prices move higher and hopefully stay higher for a sustained period of time. Looking at our heavy, heavier feeder cattle prices, this is our, our seven and eight weight steers. Um, in Kentucky, monthly average price. Um, and again, I probably should have started with this. For a lot of these slides, the red line will always be 2023 data. Blue line is gonna be 2022 data. And then also to give a, a historical comparison uh, for us in the room, that black line shows a five-year average of prices. And so a lot of these slides are gonna have a similar format. We tend to like to look at year-over-year -year percent changes. We do have a lot of seasonality in our cattle markets, for example. The reason we're seeing our lightweight calf prices move higher at a faster rate compared to our heavier feeder cattle is because seasonally we tend to see those calf prices move higher as we approach a margin anticipation for spring and summer grazing. Give a bit of more of a, of a regional perspective. So this is a, 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 gra or a chart I pulled off of an article I write uh, every week with, with Kenny. Um, just kind of give you regionally what those prices have been doing. Um, and across the board from Mississippi and Arkansas to Alabama and Tennessee, Oklahoma City here in the middle, you see prices with a few exceptions kind of averaging 10 to 17% above a year ago. Um, on our heavier feeder cattle prices, again, across states averaging 12 to 17% higher than a year ago. Um, prices last week, uh, across the southeast, generally we're about flat on our heavier feeder cattle, up one, three, five percent on our lightweight calves. Um, but again, just to kind of give you a flavor of, of what cattle prices are doing in other states, reflecting the same general supply fundamentals, which we'll talk about, which is tighter cattle supplies. Even more of a historical perspective, let's look at, at what prices in Kentucky did uh, in 2022 compared to the past 12 or so years. Um, and so the, uh, the blue line here is our four and five weight steers in Kentucky. 
Red is our five and six weight steers. Green is our heavier feeder cattle, seven and eight weight steers. Um, and those, those numbers that are put up were the averages uh, for 2022. Um, and so again, we're not quite out of place like we were 2013, 2014, and, and 2015, where we all remember how, how quickly the market seemed to fall out from under us. Um, but the expectation is that we're going to get to a place very similar to where we were 2013, 2014. Now, again, if we all recall what, what occurred during those, those years, I'm sure a lot of us in this room probably have some scars from how quickly prices seemed to fall in 2015. It seemed like prices were so strong during that time, everyone and their best friend was selling bread heifers. We expanded rather quickly and prices declined as such. Um, my expectation for where we are in the current cattle cycle, um, for, for where drought is and, and, and was, um, I think we're going to see prices in a very similar range as 2013, 2014, but I think that we're going to see those prices remain higher and, and be sustained at a pretty high level for a longer period of time. Um, I don't think we've got the replacement heifers to, to build back as quickly as we did 2013, 2014. Um, and for a lot of our big cow states, they still don't even have the grass to expand if they wanted to. So we're going to see prices very similar to 2013, 2014, and they're going to stay there a little longer as well. Now, if you'd asked me my opinion on that a year ago, I would have been more hesitant to be as bold as to say we're going to see something similar to 2013, 2014. But with the data that we have on hand, it, it's pretty clear that's the situation that we're going to find ourselves in as an industry. Higher cattle prices across the board. The main factor driving that, the single biggest, you know, the engine that moves the entire industry is the cattle cycle. And so uh, every January, USDA puts out their January cattle inventory report. I'm sure there's several of you in this room that have probably got a call from USDA to answer a survey from them. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time doing that, but but what USDA does every January is they estimate cattle numbers for every class of cattle you can think of, um, both nationally and for each state. These first two columns, these are our national numbers. This is the percent change in our national numbers compared to our January 2022 inventory numbers. Arkansas for comparison, this is my home state. And then these last two columns show our, our Kentucky numbers. Um, nationally, inventory is totaling 89.274 million head down 3% compared to inventory as a year ago. If we want to understand long term where beef production is headed, the three most important rows to look at, I realize this is a busy table, beef cows on hand, beef replacement heifers, and then our calf crop. Nationally, beef cow numbers down 3.6% to a total of 28.912 million beef cows, lowest beef cow total since the 60s. Um, we'll give more historical comparison in a moment. Um, if you ask more, mo most analysts about this number pre-report, um, including myself, we were probably thinking that number was going to be closer to a 4.2 to, 4 to a 4.5% decline in beef cow numbers. So one thing that USDA does that makes this really tricky to try and forecast as an analyst is in addition to putting out the January 2023 numbers, they also will go in and they'll revise the 2022 numbers. And that's what they did. So they put out the total beef cow estimate for 2023 and they lowered their estimate for the number of beef cows we had January 2022. So as an analyst, what USDA is doing is they're moving the dartboard as you're trying to forecast prices, which makes it a little trickier. Um, in absolute value, we were pretty right on with where we would be cow numbers, but most analysts would say that they were a bit off on this number here, 3.6%, again, because USDA has is, is kind of moved the dartboard as we're trying to project out what that number is. But lowest beef cow number since the 60s nationally. About what I expected to see in Arkansas, Kentucky down 7.3%. When we get down to beast replacement heifers, 6% decline nationally, 
13% decline in Arkansas, 8% decline in Kentucky. Arkansas was one of 14 states to have a double digit decline in beef replacement heifers numbers. So any indication of moving towards a scenario where we're going to expand the herd, um, those beef replacement heifer numbers would suggest otherwise that we are in for another year, two more years of, of potential um, herd liquidation. Um, the other states included in this category that had double digit declines in beef cow replacement heifer numbers were, were states as significant as Kansas and Iowa and as obscure as states like Massachusetts and, and Delaware. So a big range of states there, but the point is there were several states that had double digit declines in replacement heifer numbers. Um, reflecting on why that was the case in Arkansas, um, the best hypothesis that I could come up with is that the financial situation for our farms in Arkansas was such that they needed to maintain cash flow with lower cattle prices the past couple of years, and so they sold off more heifers than, than some other states, potentially. Looking at where we are in the current cattle cycle, 2014 till present, um, the next task is for us to try and figure out in this room uh, where the bottom is of the cattle cycle and when will we start to see any significant level of herd expansion. Now, as I said, 89.27 million head, all cattle and calves, still above the low of 2014. Um, and the expectation, again, is that this is not the bottom. We're going to have another year of decline. It's going to take us until 2025 until we see herd expansion on a, on a national level. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't people in this room even that, that will have the grass and will have the, the prices and profitability to expand. This is just saying nationally, we don't have the replacement heifers to, to do anything significant in terms of herd expansion. Even more of a historical comparison, looking at where we are today relative to the past five cattle cycles. So this is that inventory number going all the way back to 1967. So the past five cattle cycles, you can see those periods of expansion liquidation, expansion, liquidation, all driven by profitability and the availability of forage. A couple things to notice about these numbers that I think are worth mentioning. First, this table breaks out how long each cattle cycle was. So the 1967 to 79 cattle cycle lasted 13 years. The 1979 to 1990 cattle cycle lasted 12 years. With the exception of 1990 to 2004, you can pick up the trend here that cattle cycles are getting shorter. And the average number of head in each cycle is declining. The range, that's just the difference between the maximum number of head during a cattle cycle and the minimum number of head during a cattle cycle. Basically saying that we've got shorter cattle cycles and they are less variable in how big those jumps are and declines are in terms of expansion and liquidation. Um, I've been spending probably a couple weeks reflecting on why I think that's the case. And again, the best hypothesis I have for that is, um, I think if we're talking about the 60s, it's probably pretty easy to go buy some land and go buy some cows and be in the cattle business, right? It's a lot harder to do that today. With the, the capital assets we have tied up in production, the, uh, the availability of land, um, I, so I would say that's probably actually a good thing. We, we can liquidate fewer head and still get a pretty large price response from it. So less variable cattle cycles, largely reflective of the capital requirements to be in the business. But again, we can sell and liquidate fewer head and get a pretty big price response out of it relative to the 60s where you had periods of liquidation upwards of 6% which is a lot more extreme than the declines we've seen the past couple of years. That leads us into a discussion of, of beef supplies. Um, what this red line shows is federally inspected beef production on an annual basis. What this dotted line shows is cattle inventories, that number that we've been talking about. So what do you notice? We've had cattle inventories that have been in decline since 2019 but federally inspected beef production has continued to move higher. 2022 was a record for beef production. We have never produced more beef in this country than we did last year. 
previous record was 2021. So we're setting records on beef production, but we've got cattle inventories that have been in decline since 2019. If you look at calf crop numbers, those have actually been in decline since 2018. So clearly something's not lining up. Um, where we're gonna be this year is we're gonna see those numbers line up, where we're gonna see a decline in beef production. But if you think about why these two numbers have not really lined up, again, it goes back to the, the story of drought. What this table shows us is 2022 cattle slaughter by class and 2021 slaughter by class of animal and then the year over year percent change in those numbers. So last year we saw a 2% decline in fed steer slaughter. Where did we see gains on slaughter? On replacement or on heifers that were probably should have been replacements if we had the grass to do so and then beef cows. Heifer slaughter up 5% beef cow slaughter up 11%. So basically what happens is, in the near term, when we're in a phase of liquidation, we're selling more cows that are going to beef production, we're selling more heifers that probably would have normally been on our farms, and so in the short term, that will boost beef production. And that's what we've seen the past couple of years. We've been in decline for so long though that we are going to this year see declines in beef production. I'll show you uh, what those estimates look like in a few slides. But again, as I said, the calf crop, which is the, the main source of, of cattle that, that make their way through the supply chain and, and eventually do become beef, have been in decline since 2018. Again, the increases in beef production have been driven by beef cow liquidation and the lack of retention of replacement heifers. We're starting to see those numbers finally line up. Every month USDA puts out their, their monthly cattle on feed report, which estimates inventories of cattle on feed and feedlots with an excess capacity of 1,000 head. So these are your larger commercial feedlots as a, compared to your, your smaller farmer feeders. Um, but January on feed numbers, 11.68 million head down 3%. Um, all of 2021, if you ask myself, if you asked Dr. Burdine, we were saying, we're gonna see those numbers decline. We're gonna see those numbers decline. Uh, it just took a little longer to get there again because those heifers on feed was, was keeping that number higher for a longer period of time than maybe we thought. So moving through the year, expect those cattle on feed numbers to run below 2022 levels for most of 2023. There might be a couple months where on feed numbers come up above year ago levels, but in general, again, cattle on feed totals are gonna to be very reflective of the tight supply situation that we've been in. How does that translate to beef production? Um, this is quarterly beef production in the US. Um, you can see the, the disruption clearly in 2020. Um, the red line is USDA's forecast for beef production out of their monthly WASDE report. Um, and so they're forecasting about a 6% decline um, in beef production this year. Um, their January forecast was actually to see a 7% a decline in beef production. So they've actually raised their estimate for beef production, still a 6% decline, but again, a month ago, they were expecting that to be closer to 7%. Again, that's reflective of the expectation that we're probably not done liquidating the herd. Um, we're really, really tight on hay this winter. Um, some states out west haven't had grass in a couple years now. So USDA's expectation is that we might see beef production lifted slightly first part of 2023. Not above 2022 levels, just not as low as we might have thought even a month ago. But the overall supply situation here is very, very bullish for cattle prices. Again, setting up a very similar scenario to where we were 2013, 2014, 2015. The other component to this that we need to monitor, probably the thing that I'm monitoring much more closely, it's very obvious where we are with supplies. The more important thing I would argue to monitor is what's, uh, what's happening to the US consumer. First place to start is to look at retail meat prices. 
Retail choice beef is blue. Retail pork is red. Broiler composite price is green. These are quoted in cents per pound. And again, these aren't the, the prices of any individual cut. You know, the, the market for brisket and the market for ribeye have very separate, distinct market dynamics that can cause those prices to do different things. So instead of looking at the price of any specific product, just looking at a composite weighted average price for beef, pork, and chicken. So beef most recently averaged 757 cents a pound, which is another way of saying $7.57 a pound. Um, certainly much higher than pork and, and broiler. Um, the concern that we have is that when beef is, is as high as it is on a per pound basis, relative to the main competing proteins that we're gonna see some large scale substitution away from beef towards uh, pork and, and, and chicken consumption. Um, as we know though, that's not really the way we think when we shop, we care about what prices are doing relative to one another. So all I did in this graph was I took the price of beef and I divided it. I divided it by the price of pork and I divided it by the price of chicken to see what are beef prices doing relative to chicken prices and pork prices. When we're making decisions about consumption, we do so on a relative basis. What's the price of this relative to the price of, of this other thing? So what this number would tell us, 3.5 for September 2021, for example, for beef relative to chicken. I would say that beef prices are 3.5 times higher than chicken prices. Another way of thinking about it, that's like saying one pound of beef is worth 3.5 pounds of chicken. This blue line, that means that beef prices are 1.5 times higher than pork prices or one pound of beef is worth 1.5 pounds of pork. Now, what do you notice about this blue line? It's been relatively stable, right? Um, if that number is moving up or down a lot, that is when you would start to think there's probably some substitution going on with US consumers. As that red line has come down, beef has actually become more price competitive relative to chicken. So again, we have high meat prices across the board, what matters is what those prices are doing relative to one another. Beef and pork has remained relatively stable through time, become more price competitive with chicken through time. So substitution really isn't the issue that we need to be worrying about. The other number that you will see quoted in the farm press a lot this year that will be used incorrectly is per capita beef consumption. Average or was 59.2 pounds per person 2022, forecasted to decline to 56.3 pounds per person in 2023. Again, you will see this number quoted a lot this year as some signal of mass erosion of beef demand. That will be incorrect. So the way this number is calculated, and I hate this, the way it's used or quoted in, in the farm press is, all they do here is they take beef and cold storage, they add production, they add imports, and they subtract exports. They divide that number by the US population. Does that sound like consumption to any of you? Doesn't to me. Production is in that estimate. So if we're gonna see a decline in production, we're probably gonna see a decline in consumption. But that really has no bearing on beef demand in the US. What matters for us is price times quantity. Consumption can go down, but if prices go up, that can actually offset the decline. This is the amount of money that consumers are spending on beef, pork, and chicken on an annual basis. Beef is clearly still the protein that US consumers spend the most money on. That's money to our industry relative to money to the pork industry or the chicken industry. Down slightly to $449 a person, still the second highest beef expenditure going back to 86. Um, we've seen some small declines in beef demand, but again, the point is nowhere near as severe is what people that use this number as an indicator would suggest. Just to be aware of that, this will be quoted a lot this year, and again, it's not a sign of some mass erosion of US beef demand. There are a couple concerns. I could put every single person asleep in this room if I talked about inflation for 10 minutes. 
I won't do that. I'll do that for about a minute. Um, so this red line is growth in average hourly wages. This blue line is inflation on an annual basis measured by the consumer price index. When that red line is above the blue line, we see an increase in the standard of living for US consumers. When that blue line is above the red line, we see a decrease in the standard of living for US consumers. Currently, inflation is sitting at 6.4%. I'll do it next time. Um, thank you. Wage growth is at 4.7%. So clearly, there's some inflationary issues for consumers. Inflation has come down to 6.4%, still well above the target that the government has of 2%. So if there's issues with, with beef demand, it's, it's probably coming from inflation relative to consumer income. For example, um, last week we had Valentine's Day. Typically, we go out to eat in our house. That did not happen. We stayed home and, and, and cooked. That's one example of the decisions that consumers are making in the face of inflation. I can tell you that I bring my lunch to work a lot more now than I did a year or two ago. But there's, a, there's a one thing I do like to remind people about beef demand. There's a lot more that matters besides price. Um, this is a survey that's done by Kansas State University where they, they survey consumers in each state. This is consumers in Kentucky. And they ask this group of, of, of respondents to how much do you value each of these traits when you're purchasing protein at a grocery store? Labels that have a positive number mean that those are things that, US, that consumers in Kentucky value the highest when they're purchasing protein at the grocery store. Labels that have a negative number mean that those are things that Kentucky consumers really don't care that much about at all when they're purchasing protein at a grocery store. So what things do matter most to consumers in Kentucky. That's taste, freshness, safety, price is fourth. So I would argue despite the macroeconomic concerns, if as an industry in Kentucky we continue to align ourselves and produce something that hits the mark on all of these, there is demand growth potential for all of us in this room. Just something to be, to be aware of. I'm going to skip trade. We can go back to it if we need to. I again want to keep us on time. Finishing up with a price and profitability outlook. This is what the, the futures market closed out on Friday. Um, so again, these prices are a couple days old. That's not really the point of this. The point of this is, in what direction is that line trending from month to month? So this is the, the closing price on the March contract, the April contract, all the way out to the October 2023 futures contract. That line is, is sloping upward, right? That's not always the case. Um, so that market is pricing in those expectations of tight supplies this fall. This also shows us that there is a lot of value of gain potential for those that have grass this spring and this summer as stocker operations. That's reflective of the feedlot situation. This is feedlot data out of Kansas, which calculates out their feeding cost of gain. Averaged a little over $135 per hundred weight feeding cost of gain. If you calculate out implied value of gain on our cattle markets in Kentucky or Arkansas, for example, value of gain is going to strongly reflect feedlot cost of gain. The more expensive it is to put on pounds in a feedlot, the higher the value of gain potential is for us as stocker operations. And so that's the situation that we're going to find ourselves in, at least this spring and this summer. What ultimately drives the industry, though, is profitability for our cow-calf operations. This is average estimated cow-calf returns above cash costs and pasture rent on a per cow basis. Now, some operations are going to make more than this. Some operations are going to make less than this. The point is this is average returns to cow-calf producers. Estimated at $121 a cow, moving all the way up to $250 a cow in 2024. Now that's strong profitability. I said earlier that profitability is what dri drives the cattle cycle. We can be profitable and have high cattle prices. If we don't have the, the grass to do so though, we're not going to expand. So sitting in this room, I talked about the value of gain potential this spring and this summer. 
The market really, 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 really wants someone to have grass this year, to have some heavier feeder cattle later on in the year. Sitting in this room, we're in a much better place than some of our neighbors out west. Now, I do realize that it's not critical that we have rain today as it is rain in April, May, in the summer. But relative to some other parts of the country, again, those that have grass this year are certainly going to be rewarded for it, and that's what the futures market is currently pricing in. Um, so again, I, I, I kept this on time. That's a, that's a good goal. Um, my guiltless plug of the work that I do, for those that are tech savvy, you can scan this barcode thing. Um, Dr. Burdine and, and Dr. Maples at Mississippi State, we write a, a newsletter every week that's southeast focused. Um, the three of us realize that we don't get to see every group of producers, but probably once a year, but markets move almost daily. So this is a way for us to communicate to you on a, on a regular basis what's happening out there. Um, so if you want to scan this, you can. Um, email me, call me, happy to sign you up myself if you're not someone who, who wants to, to scan in with their phone. So I appreciate your time. Um, we can take questions, like I said. Um, those that are just really, really hungry, I guess, can, uh, can go get lunch. But uh, happy to, to have a conversation, uh, answer any questions that you might have. Again, I appreciate everyone's time and really appreciate the invitation. Yes, sir. Well, I think as we've seen uh, the past couple of years, dang near anything can happen. Uh, there's a war on the other side of the world that's impacting fertilizer markets. So I think the biggest risk between now and fall is seeing our, our input costs go even higher. But I think there's ways to mitigate that risk through management, though. Yes, sir? High is too high. For what? How high is too high? In Arkansas, they already have. Uh, so they, they stopped buying last week in Arkansas. $210 was too high for them in Arkansas. Um, but that's, that's an individual decision, and that, that really matters relative to how you're going to price in um, those heavier feeder cattle. So by, for example, we're going to talk about LRP this afternoon. We've got really high calf prices. I think there's still tools out there to lock in a, a pretty favorable margin despite high calf prices. But in Arkansas, at least, the past couple weeks, uh, $210 was too high for them. Sir? Yeah, um, so that's a relatively new thing. I mean, there's always been some dairy, dairy steers that, that come into to production. Um, we're starting to see more and more of that. And, and best that I figured, uh, those dairies are kind of treating those as two separate enterprises now. You've got your dairy operation and you've got your dairy beef operation. Um, if you look at dairy steer slaughter as a percent of total slaughter, it's not enough to really move the needle on production, at least in the near term. Anything else? Well, if not, like I said, I'm going to hang around for a bit. Uh, happy to have a conversation with anybody. Um, again, appreciate the time.